Okay, welcome to chapter nine of the Hasidic approach to joy. And this is a this is an integral chapter, actually. This is a very integral to the entire conversation, really. And this all comes back to getting beyond the ich. Now, ich is uh, the Yiddish word for I, but it basically means getting past the ego. That's that's the bottom line. And the the Hebrew, the key Hebrew words we're going to hear, talk about tonight are yeshus, yeshus, which comes from the word yesh, existence, uh, and it will be compared to ego. Yeshus is like you know the, the self ego, and bittel, bittel is the opposite, the opposite of yeshus, the opposite of 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 egotistical self centeredness. And we're going to talk into that. One. What I find interesting about this 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 chapter, really, I think this chapter is the, in one sense, is very is much easier for the military crowd, because the military crowd has been taught all about mission first. It's all about the mission, and that yes, you are important, but you are important as your contribution to the mission. And so that's going to be the, that's really going to be the crux of the whole conversation tonight. Is that is it about me, or is it about the mission? That's that's going to be the the, the whole focus, really. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to talk. We get into the idea that Yeshus is, is the um, means the obsession with self. It's it's all about me. So the the person who has a lot of Yeshus, a lot of of, of self consciousness, self consciousness is not a bad thing. But what are we prioritizing? You know, self-image is important. It builds self-confidence. It builds resiliency. You know, you have to be able to know that you're mission critical, that you are important and valuable. But the focus on self aspect, when self begins to dominate one's approach to life, that's when all the negative stuff comes up because that's when if if the ego isn't satisfied, depression comes in and sluggishness comes about, and essentially that that yeshus that the uh, that self centeredness takes one down when when we're not getting our way, right? That that's what all becomes about. So I'm going to share an example. Uh, this was an this was an interesting example, but I but but we're talking about. Uh, Part of this is self-esteem, and part of this is self-image, uh, and then and going too far. So here's here's my story. I was a teaching in California, in Long Beach, California, and it was about the, about the fifth year I was there. And one of my former first grade students, who was now a a fourth grade student, he came down with childhood diabetes. And at that time, um, yeah, it was pretty scary, pretty scary thing. And it wasn't very, you know, very well under control. I'm going to hold on to this story for a second. So this, this fourth grader now had diabetes and it was very scary for the family. They didn't understand a lot about it. And it was very scary, obviously, for the, for the student himself. It happens to be that uh, this student, uh, let's call him Fred. Fred had a twin brother, right? So Fred and and let's just use George because those are my fa favorite English names, right? So Fred is is now being challenged <coughs> with childhood diabetes and maintaining it and controlling it. And since I'm the only EMT on on campus. I'm by de facto the medical officer on campus. And so the the um, children's hospital sent somebody out to have a conversation with me about what is this? What does this look like? How do you deal with it? And in this particular case, how to monitor it. They gave me equipment. And essentially, if he didn't feel right, then his responsibility was to go to my classroom. So his fourth grade teacher would send him to my classroom, for, my first grade classroom. I would do a blood test on him. We decided he was too high and needed to get some exercise in to bring it down. 
or if he was too low and he needed to have a glass of orange juice or something. And I would facilitate that part and send it back to class and we managed. And, and this was going on for a while, right? So I, I decided part of the scary thing, one of the scariest things about life is when you, when you don't have any control, when there's, you don't know how to manage something. That's, that's what's scary, right? And so I decided to take his class, this fourth grade class. This is the, this is the youngest class I ever took rock climbing. And I take, took them out to Riverside, to Mount Rubidoux in Riverside. And I set up a top rope climb of about probably a good 25 feet climb, 20, 25 foot climb. Um, and I set up the top rope, set it up, and each kid took a turn. I had a couple of fathers with me to help facilitate. And each kid got a chance to, to work on climbing this, this near vertical wall. And some kids did well, some kids didn't do so well, some kids were excited about it, some kid kind of begged off. Uh, after the first start of it. And then it came Fred's turn. And Fred starts up and he starts to beg off. Now, most kids, I, I you know, they beg off, I let him off. I didn't let him off so easy. I said, no, no, you, you can do this. And encouraged him more than average to, you can do this. I'm not letting you off so easy. Get up there. And he'd spent a good 25 minutes on this wall, fighting this wall, climbing. And he finally got up to the top of this wall and he belayed, I belayed him down. He, you know, he repelled down. And, and when I went to take him off the harness, this nine-year-old kid looks at me and he says, I need to do that again. <laughs> and I said, by all means. And he turned around. And he went right up that rock, right up, and came down and smiled. And I unhooked his harness and he walked away. <laughs> I noticed from that day, he was different. He carried himself higher. He carried himself with confidence. I knew what happened. I saw it. And in fact... I could see him and his identical twin brother walking down the, the campus and I could tell who was who because Fred would carry his shoulders. He stood a little taller, right? He did fine. Years went by and I, you know, I didn't know if he knew what happened that day. About, I'm going to say 15 years later, 12 years, 12 to 15 years later, I was back in Los Angeles and I was at a, a, a wedding of a friend. And it was, uh, and it, I, I see the twins coming down the hall. And, and I can tell which one's Fred from a distance, I can tell. <laughs> and now they're both college students and they're, you know, and they came, they gave me a big hug. And Fred said, Hey, you remember the day you changed my life? <laughs> And I smiled and I said, absolutely, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. You were fantastic. Now, fast forward some 15 years, and I'm doing business and life coaching, and I'm focusing on, on coaching dads to, to live into their, you know, their fatherhood uh, and, and working with their teenage sons and things. And I was trying to build a practice. So I wrote up this story to be included in a magazine about coaching, about business, about personal coaching. The editors were still working on getting a handle of this digital world. And the publisher I had sent it to was sending it to her team with her comments on the story, not realizing that she had not sent it to them, she had hit return. And her comments were, who does this egotist think he is? <laughs> I mean, she liked three sentences, but it was scathing. <laughs> when I said when I sent back an email saying, Did you mean to send this to someone other than me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So now she was so embarrassed, she she published the article. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way to get it published. <laughs> um, but but it made me stop and think, right? Part of my thinking was about, you know, why am I using this story? And then part of my thinking was also about what did I really do? I didn't do the work. I, I made an opportunity available and I encouraged someone to take the opportunity and he did. And he did the work and he did the hard work. And he's the one who owns the success. And in writing that article, I was looking to take some ownership of that success, which is not really mine. I created an opportunity. I had I, I, I share the, the the means to do so, but I didn't do the work. He did. So when I start thinking about ego, when I start to try and be the hero of that story, that's that's not true. That's about me. That's about me, not not the event in the story and the hero of the story. The hero was him. He did the work and he felt the pride in it. For me, it came to realizing, wow, I got to be a part of that. I got to help facilitate that. And, and that was marvelous. And there's a, a, a gratitude to God that that I had the opportunity, the wherewithal, the training to be have that moment and to be a part of that moment. Um, but, you know, reality check is, it wasn't about me. It was about providing an opportunity for him to have the confidence to go on with his diabetes in, in, a, in a strong, um, self-secured way to do that. And I got I to be a part of that. I disagree. If it, were, if it were not about you, pardon me, David, I'm sorry. If it were not about you, why did you write the story in first person? Actually, I think the story was not, I didn't write it. In, I wrote it in his voice, not in mine. But the point was, you wrote the story about that you provided this opportunity. Yeah, right. So when and, I wrote the what story, what you were doing is what you were doing is you were you were you were pointing out in the story that but for your foresight, but for your yes activities, it was all ego. That's that's right. Yeah, so I can see where she would would have come to the conclusion that this guy is nothing more than an egotist who's looking for an opportunity to share his ego or yeah. get her stroke. Yeah, she was 100% right. And and it, it made me stop and think about it. And it was a big lesson for me. Um, and I can tell you that I don't know if anybody even ever read the article. I saw it. I know I you know it was there. I never heard anybody comment about it. Um, I think the real value was there was the was the was the slap across the face that I got and and the real out the reality check of dude this is this is not about you right that's ego that's where you had that, of that opportunity that kid might have had a totally different life right yes true but but let's go back to the idea about if my I'm a youth director if I'm a teacher that's my job. I am just doing my mission. I'm just doing what I'm here to do. And yeah, if, so can't, can't you turn it around? And can you not turn it around and say, uh, I was granted the uh, the mitzvah of being able to affect somebody's life for the better. And because of it, I was granted a mitzvah and this person was granted a blessing. So, so now, in retrospect, because of the blessing of that slap in the face from the editor, I look back at the story and I can honestly say, 
I was I was blessed to have that opportunity. I'm I am grateful that I had that opportunity and and it was beautiful and it was wonderful. And and I'm ashamed of the ego that I allowed to creep in there and try and 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 own that story. And it's not, it's not my story. It's, but it can't you work. turn it into a learning example for people? I am. I'm say. sharing it with you right now. That's the learning example. Yeah. The learning example is don't let right. your ego get over but, a little but ego. But you're saying for the ego, ego, I would I would turn it around and say, if you see the opportunity of being able to help somebody and better their life, mm -hmm. don't let it pass you by. Yes. Because you think, you know, you're, you're grandstanding, but do it for the purpose of helping that person and let it go because it's not about you. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the lesson that, that I want to take out of it. And that's the reason I'm sharing this story. Because if, the, some, if, if that event had not gone as well, if nothing happened to that vent and that in that, that opportunity that was there, then I can't blame myself. I provided an opportunity. It wasn't yeah, taken. Away. And and okay, that's fine. But I did my job, right? I I focused on my mission was to provide the opportunity. And that's okay. Why, when it succeeded, that I think it was all about me and my success. That's ego. That's that's wrong. I don't think I, I don't think it's a, an issue of why did I think it was all about me and my success. I don't think that you did. You didn't do it in order to praise yourself for the opportunity. Right. You're talking about the way it came across, not mm -hmm. what your intention was. Right, but but at the moment you're 100 percent correct. But years later. When I was sharing the story, it was about me and it was about my ego. And that was wrong. But it's the wording that made it seem like your ego, where yeah, it, yeah, it was more story. it was it's more not. of a story about him. If somebody was really looking at it and saying, Wow, this teacher who had the opportunity. Yeah, but, but David, we have to be tell the truth here. I put published the article. Because I was looking for public PR for my coaching skills and my work, I was trying to shine a light on my abilities, and and that's that's where the error is. If this kid had shared the article, that would have been a completely separate thing. But it was me trying to shine a light on me, and that's but the ego getting involved. Sometimes you have to, yeah. because in order in order to be a success in what you're doing. I'm going to, to disagree forward. with you right off the bat. <laughs> I, and I'm going to say with it like this. I, You know I stay away from politics, but I'm going to make a political statement. It seems to be that the skill sets required to get into office today are the, are the opposite skill sets of who we want in that position. I agree with that. Well, the most part, I can agree with that. Yes, and I, I and I also agree like, with what the, a sweeping with the, generalization that yes. is. Yes, <laughs> the exception pro are, proves I the rule. There you know? are certainly instances where your observation is true. Yeah, there are lots of instances where it isn't. Thankfully, I'm glad to hear that. I haven't seen much of that, but I do stay away from politics. But but you know, I, I, the 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 example, the concept is 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 blatant in so many areas, you know. And I think that's the that's the main point, is that I don't have to be shouting, tooting my own horn, and telling people how good I am, to be able to do my job. If I'm doing my job, others will say that. But a little ego oh, is good. You didn't no, have little ego. Not ego. You probably wouldn't work. Self, as not ego. Self esteem. And that's the topic that we're talking about tonight. In other words, the idea here is that if, if we are doing our job, we can have pride and self-esteem in the work that we do and the job that we do as long as the focus is on the mission. But once the focus is on me in the mission, then I've lost 
track of, of the real the real focus and I set myself up for failure and depression when things don't go my way. You set yourself up for being obnoxious is what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> very true, very true. You know, and if, if we have the egotist, if he fails, he's going to take it hard and, and, and he's going to be, you know, depressed. Whereas if, if there, if we do our best and we, we don't succeed at it. So there's no shame or disgrace and failure. It just means that that's the way it was supposed to be. Um, It leads to the that it leads to depression, but there's based on last class, there's another way that it could go. It can lead to anger. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So all the negative things that that come about are because of the self-centeredness. If we're not focused on self, but we're focused on mission, then if it goes wrong, the question becomes. How do I fix it? How do I do the mission? How do I, you know, it, it stays mission focused, not me focused. So you don't have the depression, you don't have the anger, you don't have all those other things become that when it's when it's about me. Right? So that's because that's lately, lately in politics, we see the anger as politicians. We're not going there, Dave. Come on. Huh? We, we agreed we're not going there. <laughs> I'm I'm not going there, going there. I'm just saying <laughs> the that, example the book the book gave was the example of when a person is going to go public speaking and he's speaking in front of 500 people. So he has a self-awareness and that self-awareness can go negative. It can be about him. Now, if his self-awareness is about how he pretends, presents the material and how well the material is accepted because of the way it presents, then it's about the material, it's about the mission, it's about the presentation. But if it's about himself and how he looks in front of a crowd, that's an ego thing. And that's where it can go south. You know, when we're same guy is going to get a, on a subway, you know, he's aware of himself, he's aware of where he's stepping, he's aware of where he's standing, he's aware of himself, but he's not about him. It's about where he's going. So again, it comes back to is it about the mission? Is it about the self? So when we carry out our day-to-day -day activities and we're aware of what we're doing, but we're not attaching any self-importance to it, then it's about the deed. We approach it matter of fact, and we deal with the situation that's in front of us. So really that comes back to this question of, are we aware, concerned about, how we appear to others and what they think of us, or are we com concerned about the mission getting completed? Both. And and I tell you, if if you're if you're if if you're concerned about completing the mission, how you present it is going to, could well be critical in whether or not you can successfully complete the the mission. Yeah. If you don't if you don't give concern and care to you as the presenter, the impression you make, not that the mission makes, but that you make, you're trying to sell the buyers who may not even get past you because you turn them off. So it's important for you to give consideration to you, to self, in order to accomplish the mission. You can't separate the two. So what we're talking about then is self-awareness as it reflects to the mission versus it's all about me. You're trying to separate the two absolutely like using a knife to cut them apart. <laughs> and I don't think that that's a, a, an appropriate way to deal with it. I think that you have a little bit of both. Right, so it's, it's important to have the self-awareness and to have 
personal pride in your appearance and personal pride in your professional performance. All those things are true. But when you cross that line into being about yourself, that's when, when that's when the ego is about involved. you. When it's all about you, you know, I agree. If 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 it's all about you, there is no mission. So so let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to share a story. Share a story in the legal realm from your experience about an example where it was not about the case and justice. It was about the lawyer himself. How could you tell the difference in court when the guy is egocentric about himself or whether he's actually concerned about the case at hand? You're on mute. I was prosecuting a uh, criminal case, obviously, <clears throat> and it involved search and seizure. And the defense attorney in, in raising the issue, the process is that the defense attorney challenges the validity of the search. That's the way you do it. The defense attorney gets to ask questions first. And the defense attorney can lead the witness. Actually, the defense attorney gets to cross-examine the witness he calls. It's a big advantage for the defense attorney. This particular defense attorney uh, was so anxious to win his motion. He was representing a syndicate defendant. So this wasn't nickel and dime stuff. Uh, he asked the questions and he won his motion. He had it won, but he had to make sure. And he had to make sure because it was important to him because he had an audience and it had to look good. So he asked one more question. <laughs> and the one more question was one too many. And he thought, boy, he really nailed it. Well, it turns out he didn't nail it. And it gave me an opportunity to re rehabilitate the witness. And the motion to suppress was denied. And his client ended up being indicted. Now, remember, this is a syndicate defendant. The lawyer ended up with two broken knees. Oh, ouch. This is a true story. <laughs> Welcome um, to Chicago. Pardon me? Welcome to Chicago. <laughs> Oddly enough, the lawyer's brother, who was a fine lawyer, became the dean of a law school in Chicago. <laughs> the brothers were not alike. <laughs> but, but the point of the story, the point of the story to your point yeah. was... He had it be all about him. And as a result, both his client, the mission, and he, all about him, lost. Right. I don't know yeah. if that illustrates your point. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, and that's where and that's what we're talking about here is that is that Bittel, which is Bittel does not mean self-effacement in the sense of negating one's successes. But bittel is really, um, it means nullified to the cause. And I think that's what comes back down to, and we started off the class this evening talking about, you know, members who've been in service, whether that's in military service or even, you know, uh, nonprofit service and like Civil Air Patrol, you, you're putting yourself your side, yourself, you're putting yourself aside to accomplish something which is greater than you. And so, you know, even though I can say I have seen ego in Civil Air Patrol, I, I, I've seen it. <laughs> Come on, not in Civil Air Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the same time, there is, there is this mission focus that people in service have put themselves aside for a greater cause 
And so there's an understanding of what that really looks like. There are a lot of pe folks in the in in the civilian world, uh, or the I'm going to say outside the nonprofit world, who have have missed out on that. Um, not exclusively, it, it's open to anyone, but at the same time, you know, when, when we any time we put ourselves out for something greater than ourselves, that's the bittle. And, and there you see where, where the ego has been put aside, not self-esteem, not self-awareness, but ego has been put aside for a greater good. And, and that's where you see the strength of, of, of um, resiliency in service is because it's not about me, it's about the mission. And therefore, we're able to get back in and get up and, and keep going and we don't feel the depression and the 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 loss when we don't accomplish the goal is we know we gave it our best and we go forward and we're not taking it personal that's the thing is we're not taking it personal i'm going to ask jeff now give us an example from your thir your 30 years on the chicago police force when you see a guy uh, you know people who have given away literally put their life on the line literally put their life on the line for the service of others. And yet sometimes the ego creeps in and it's about them. It's no longer about the service. How do you see that distinction in action? Give me an example for, that you've seen. No names. Well, I mean, I've seen a lot of good work out there over the years, but let me tell you the some of the guys that do it uh, and myself included, I'm I'm no better than them. Uh, would take the paper and, and hand it to the next supervisor, that would be me, and said, uh, you know, look at this, this was a really good arrest, I saved a life, uh, uh, I, I put away a few bad guys today, and and I think I should get a department commendation or, you know, uh, honorable mention, and, uh, you know, <laughs> they pat themselves on the back, you know what I'm saying, but uh, hey, the, we do the whole thing in the military too, we, we, that's what we have awards for. You know. Right. So there's a distinction between the awards being there to acknowledge great service and someone fighting to get his own award. <laughs> well, let's just say that a lot of times the upline supervisor might never know about what happened if if uh, the squeaky wheel didn't, you know, squeak. So, <laughs> so then tell me. So tell me then. How do you dif differentiate between the self-promotion and egotistical? Mm. Yeah, well, there are people that uh, pat themselves on the back for a job that wasn't that great. <laughs> okay. Good example. Good example. No, I, I wonder if the. Go ahead, Bob. In in the example that you gave, Jeff. If the reason the fellow did the the good job uh, did it with with courage and all the good reasons. If the reason he did it is because he wanted to do the good job, it was the right thing to do, and he wants to get, after the fact, he wants to get commended for it, God love him. Well, that's how but I feel. The reason, it, is ego. it is ego still. And 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 to, to pat himself on the back after it's done, uh, as far as I'm concerned, God love him. If the reason he did it was to get the praise, there you go. Yeah, then you got a different situation. And yeah, I think that's the differentiation that the rabbi is talking about. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That I think that was very helpful because people are, you know, people are out there doing a good job because that's what they what they signed up to do and they want to do. And self advocacy is not a bad thing, but if if you're pushing for 
if you go to do the job because you want the acknowledgement, that can go negative and and lead to depression when one doesn't get his way. <laughs> Judy, how about in the nursing industry? Well, <laughs> what comes to mind to me is, is the nurse who has a good relationship with a patient and has brought that patient forward in the recovery process, but doesn't want anybody else to take care of the patient because she has decided that she's <laughs> the only one that can do the job. There you go. Yeah. Right. So she starts taking possession of the success. Yep. Uh, I don't remember, forget who said it, but uh, there was some quote about uh, we both, we can be most successful when no one cares about who gets credit for it. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think that's where we're all focused on the mission. We're all trying to get the job done and who cares where the credit goes. You know, uh, I, I think, you know, when you look at all of the um, Medal of Honor recipients mm. and the common thread from all of them is that their response is, I was just doing my job. Yeah. Well, we just acknowledge that you went beyond, above and beyond your job. We've all said that. We've got people who are backing that. We've got witnesses and years of testimony to get you to this point. And they say no. And yet that person turns around and says, I was just doing my job. That's what the most recent Medal of Honor said. What exactly. Honor said. Yeah. That's, that's what they all say. Yeah, that's the common thread. They all it's a common, they all say I was just doing my job. Now, I think that's the point where they can acknowledge by accepting the award, they are acknowledging the reality. But but like Bob was saying. When the action was done, they felt they were doing what they needed to do, period. Afterwards, should we acknowledge them? Yes, we should be. We should definitely be acknowledging them. And in Civil Air Patrol, for example, it's a nonprofit, it's a nonprofit agency. It is an all-volunteer agency. If you don't acknowledge the volunteers for the service they're giving, then they're not going to hang around anymore. So it's very important to the organization to be acknowledging that, and we should be seeking those opportunities. But the person who's doing the act in the t at the moment, are they doing it for their own glorification and aggrandizement? Or are they doing it for the right reasons? And it's nice to get acknowledged for that. What about people who are wired to be heroes? Are they doing it to be a hero? Or are they doing it because that's just who they are? Most, well, it seems that all of them doing it just because that's the way they are. And then when it's done, they're not looking for any special acknowledgement for it. They just think it's something that they should do. They have the capability of doing, and therefore they should do it. There is this, um, I'll admit that I'm a, a Marvels fan uh, from way back and before movies was a thing. And there's this critical statement that was made in one of the, in the Spider-Man uh, show. I forget which one, I, I'm not that big of a fan. <laughs> but there was this, there's a critical comment where, where Peter Parker says to Tony Stark, if you have the skills and abilities that I have and you don't use them and things go wrong, that's on you. Mm -hmm. That'd be my favorite line of the whole series, right? <laughs> we've, we've got the talents. We use them for the right reasons. If we get called a hero and we get awarded and we get acknowledged, that's all good and fine, but that's not about ego. It's about a job well done. If I'm doing it because I want the, the, the credit for it, I want the awards for it, I want to be acknowledged publicly if you don't get that, that's where depression comes in. That's where the atzvah comes in. The guy who is worried about the mission, who wants the mission to be accomplished, he doesn't go to depression. He goes into marirus, 
that bitterness. He goes into how do we get this done? I, you know, there's that famous quote from NASA, right? You know, option is not failure is not an option. Period. It's not. Figure this out. You know, so that's not about being a hero. That's about the mission. And that's where we want to flow. So the, the whole focus of tonight's class really comes down to this idea of that focus on mission success versus on me being acknowledged and, and, and awarded for anything I do. It comes down to that, that, that line, crossing that line. You know, I, absolutely. Someone does good. They should be acknowledged. They should be awarded. Um, and, and if they have to, you know, share the facts of what happened so that they can, that can actually happen. No problem. When they going into the actions, are they doing it for their self aggrandizement or are they doing it because the job needs to get done? That's that. That's the distinguishing point. And, and if we do it without ego, so now let's take the big picture, go the big, big picture, the whole big thing, right? We talked about the purpose of creation and we talk about this time of creation. We talked about God created in the Garden of Eden and puts man in the Garden of Eden to work the garden and make this world a better place. That's our job. If we do a good job of that, then we're mission centric. Great. If we get caught up in getting my accolades, then we're losing track. It becomes about us. And that's when things go bad. Go for it, Jeff. Can I make yeah. a counter hang statement on. to it? Okay. Dave, hang on. Jeff, you're up. No, I just wanted to know, what does this have to do with joy? Oh, <laughs> yeah, very close. Very simple. Because if we're focused on ourselves and things don't go well, then we get depressed and feel bad and we go down. If it's about mission, then we feel marirous, bitterness, and we want to see it done, we work harder, we find another way, we get back into action. And therefore, we find a way to get it done. And so if we're on track for mission accomplishments, we can be joyous along the way because we're doing what we should be doing. And if we fail, hey, we gave it our best, and there's no reason to get depressed or sad. And there's, a, and there's an energy to go find another way to get the job done. So this core, this comes back to that whole very base core. If we're mission centric, we can be joyful because we're getting the mission job, the mission done. Our job in the world is to make the world a better place. Our job in the world is to do another act of good and kindness and to make this this world a better place. That's our job. If we're focused on that, we're working on that. Things not go well. Pick yourself up. Get back to it. The job has to get done. It's not about me. But if it's about me and my accolades, I've lost track of the mission. And now if it's not getting done, well, that's really sad. That's depressing. And it sucks your energy out, and then you go back to bed and don't do anything. So the Hasidic approach to joy is to say to stay mission-centric. One of the things I talk about with cadets all the time is the fact that you are alive means that you are mission-critical. God doesn't create junk. God doesn't have any excess waste stuff. You're here because you are needed. There's something you have to accomplish in the world that's mission critical. And, and you got to go do it. You got to figure it out. You got to go do it, right? But it's not about you. It's about mission. Hmm. So we're joyful all the time because you stay focused on the mission. Okay. That puts it in perspective. Thank you for asking. Getting that <laughs> Jeff, you're beginning to sound like me now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay. Takeaway. Takeaways from tonight. Well, what about David? He had a question. Yeah. I say there's there's uh there's an opposite to it that takes precedence, that is one of the biggest challenges, especially in the military. That if you're given a mission, it's your job to fulfill the mission. But what if the mission isn't right? So <laughs> yeah. the question becomes, what if the mission is going to compromise your life 
and other lives and and you go the opposite way because to preserve life is more important than the mission you're confusing missions i am but there it is it's a confusion it's whatever you know those who have the power will will assign you a mission and you and a group of people it would be your job to uh fulfill that mission and to the best of your ability now whether your mission is you're you're assigned with a bunch of hospital workers and you're assigned a ward you're short staff and it's it's your mission uh to be able to keep the the people in that ward comfortable and and make sure that uh nothing happens that uh, can compromise anybody so that's one mission but another mission in the military is they could say that okay it's your job to take that town um we haven't done any reconnaissance we don't know what's the, what's going to happen but we're ordering you to take that you and your and, and so many people to take that town no matter what two different kinds of missions oh, yeah. you're part of them so the the question becomes in your in your ability to preserve your life and other lives do you compromise a mission if you see a failure in in the ability of the people who assigned it to you to be able to provide you with the necessary information for you to succeed in that mission it's above my pay grade rudy you take it well <laughs> this brings to mind well, first of all remember where i grew up and that left a whole slew of indelible impressions on me and after the nuremberg trials there was hey, rudy, a concept we have a new guest on class who doesn't know the history so give us a brief 60 second review okay i was born in nazi germany i i saw the better of uh, the the two situations at age 20 i came over here rest is history i was drafted into the united states army during the vietnam war and right at the beginning of my service in the vietnam war was the story, the, the disgraceful story of the My Lai Massacre. And here we have basically what David was mentioning on steroids, because there was a situation where orders should not have been followed. And the Nuremberg Tribunal actually deep six the concept of just following orders. If there is something that you see that is unethical or basically criminal, you have the right to refuse the orders. It goes to the greater mission. Absolutely. Yes. That's what I meant by two missions. Yeah. Right. So in other words, do you follow the commander, the military commander? Do you follow the, the, the supreme commander, God Almighty himself? Right. And you take your lumps for following the supreme commander rather than your, your knucklehead commander. And there are many Jews over the centuries who have given up their lives, Al-Kiddush Hashem, to sanctify That's God's right. name rather than to do anything in any way that would desecrate godliness yeah. and and they willingly took that um, yeah. so it, it it comes back to taking the high road because ultimately uh that's the real mission yep and sometimes the high road is not easy rarely <laughs> yeah. rarely is taking the high road easy and in fact that's that's where the true mission is and that's where the real proving of our, our the proving ground is, is when we take the high road in spite of all of the challenges and the difficulties. You take the high road, and I'll take the low road. <laughs> now I'll be in Scotland for you. Well done. <laughs> hey, Rabbi, you missed your calling.